with Dave Breckenridge, and this is Under the Dome. Opposition to Alberta's COVID-19 measures have hit the Alberta legislature. Many in Premier Jason Kenney's caucus, including some high-profile members, have voiced opposition to moving to step one of the restrictions. These restrictions have put Jason Kenney at odds with some in the party's base. But is this just a bump in the road? Or is it a reopening of the right-wing rift that has hit Alberta politics before? My guests today are Edmonton Sun columnist Lauren Gunter and Ashley Joano, who covers the legislature for the Edmonton Journal and the Edmonton Sun. Thanks very much, both of you, for joining us today. Now, it's been an interesting couple months for Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. And, and most recently, over the COVID restrictions, there's been a lot of back and forth. You have people who were saying that restrictions are not tight enough, that we need more restrictions. And on the flip side, you have people who say that restrictions are too tough. We need to limit restrictions, reduce the restrictions, and maybe even reopen things outright. And what's most interesting is that a lot of these complaints are coming from within his own party. Ashley, you know, we've had, we had a letter signed by almost a quarter of his caucus, and I believe the number now is up to 18 UCP MLAs who have spoken out against COVID-19 health measures. What exactly is it that they, they have an opposition to, and what is it they're proposing instead? So the original letter was signed by 15 mostly rural uh, MLAs. Probably most notably would be Speaker of the House Nathan Cooper. Um, he's, since apo- he's since apologized for signing it. Um, a 16th MLA signed on after it was published, um, a 17th put out his own statement on Facebook questioning restrictions. Um, and then sometimes people will include an 18th MLA who has specifically raised concerns about issues with Grace Life Church and the government's decision mm-hmm. to close that down. So so there is some difference between whether you consider it 17 or 18, but either way, it is a large number of MLAs. Um, it was published the day after... Uh, it was announced that Alberta was re- reverting back to stage one of restrictions because mm-hmm. of a surge in COVID cases. So that meant, for example, a reduction in capacity at some retail locations, changes to gyms, things like that. Um, the the folks who signed the letter say that they don't support the additional restrictions. They called them a step backwards um, relative mm-hmm. to where the province was going. And they claimed that their constituents wanted them to defend their livelihoods and freedoms. Um, As for what they want instead, the letter says that they want what they're calling a transparent path forward, but it doesn't provide a lot of specifics about what exactly that would look like. Lauren, what do you get? uh, What sense do you get from these MLAs? Like, is it is it based on, you know, a conservative belief that the government shouldn't interfere too much in people's lives? Is it a sense that there are constituents that are really hammering these MLAs about what the, the government is doing? Yeah, yes, to both of those. Uh, there is a, a general suspicion of uh, of state uh, planning and, and, you know, the state being the savior that will lead us to nirvana. Uh, but there's also an awful lot of discontent in, uh, in smaller communities. You don't see it as much, I think, in Edmonton and Calgary, but it is there too. Uh, but, but you get outside the two big cities and there are an awful lot of people who don't think that the, it's it's not like they're anti-vaxxers or anti-maskers. It's just that they have not seen an awful lot of impact in their daily lives from the virus, uh, and and they're a little more risk accepting than than uh, lots of other people are anyway. I mean, they they work in higher risk jobs, or you know, they they bet their their family's fortune every year on the fact that a crop will come in. I mean, they 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 just have a higher uh, acceptance of risk than a lot of people in cities do. And I think you're seeing that, uh, you know, in, in, in general, you were talking about, you know, there are some people who think that we haven't gone far enough and other people who think we've gone too far. I think a lot, a lot of the people who think we haven't gone far enough are people whose livelihoods are secure. They get a payment every month, whether they're in the office or not. Uh, their jobs are not really all that threatened by uh, shutting down businesses. And so they have the luxury of, of demanding more uh, restriction. But you're seeing with the, the 17 or 18 MLAs, an awful lot of pressure from their constituents to speak up 
about at least going to a regional approach. You know, it, it, you know, maybe Edmonton and Calgary need to have lockdowns, but everybody else could be free. I don't want to wear a mask in Bow Island. I don't want to wear a mask in in Grand Prairie. Uh, go ahead and wear them in Edmonton and Calgary if you want to. That's the sort of attitude that they're dealing with. This isn't the first time that, that Premier Jason Kenney has faced you know, criticism from within his own caucus or face scrutiny over members of his caucus. Uh, one name that sticks out to me, uh, other than Speaker uh, Nathan Cooper, is Drew Barnes, who's the MLA for Cypress Medicine Hat. Ashley, what has Barnes really made a name for himself over in the last little bit? Well, he's certainly been one of the louder detractors, I would say. Um, he was mm-hmm. a member of the Fair Deal panel, and in June he argued that more needed to be done or Albertans should be given the option to separate. Um, in December, he issued a, uh, when when fiscal stabilization payments were in the news, he put out a statement claiming that he wanted to lead a task force um, as something he was calling the Minister of Autonomy. Um, I'll leave that up to you to interpret what that actually means. Um, in January, he apologize for falsely stating that COVID tests were only about 50% effective. Um, He was at one point part of a national coalition of politicians who were against health restrictions, um, though he has since left that. Um, He's definitely one of the louder voices you hear. And he was the one who publicly put out that letter with the 15 MLAs signed to the bottom. So, Lauren, someone like Drew Barnes has, has kind of gained quite a bit of profile. I know there was there was some thought that he might have wound up in, in cabinet after they were elected. And, of course, that didn't happen. You know, with so much scrutiny on uh, Jason Kenney right now and the decisions the government's making in terms of health measures and even how it's how it approaches uh, the budget, dealing with debt and deficit and, and spending. Could someone like Drew Barnes pose a real leadership threat to Jason Kenney? Is, or is Kenny seen as more, as more a Stephen Harper-like figure um, in that he's kind of synonymous with the party? Yeah, I, I, I don't think he poses a real leadership threat. I don't get a sense that there is a real movement to get rid of Kenny as the leader and the premier. There is discontent, though, and, and that's because the, the marriage isn't fully consummated yet between Wild Rose and the old Tory party. But, boy, I think they wish they'd put Barnes in the cabinet uh, rather than leaving him out, because if he's in the cabinet, he's far less likely to be able to speak out publicly. He's, he's used his, his uh, rejection from the cabinet. I think he's, I, I, I hesitate to say that he's, he's a little bitter about being left out of cabinet, but, uh, but I've known Drew for a very, very long time. I like him. He's a smart guy. Uh, he represents his constituents' feelings, I think, very closely. Uh, and he, he has felt frustrated. And I think it's been very good, actually, for Kenny to allow these 16, 17, 18 MLAs to speak out because he, they are voicing the concern of an awful lot of UCP members. They're not demanding something that the government can't deliver. They're not saying, well, instantly we have to get rid of mask mandates all across the province, or instantly we have to allow churches to go to side by side, you know, shoulder to shoulder, packed in uh, uh, worship services. They're not, they're not saying any of those things. I, that's, I think, the funny part about the letter is the letter says, we're not happy with what you're doing, but it doesn't then lay out other things that they would like the government to do. Barnes himself wrote an op-ed that appeared in the National Post at around the time the letter came up. And, and, and the op-ed doesn't give an awful lot of uh, ideas about what he would like to have done differently. There's just, as I'm sure you felt it too, there's just the sense in Alberta that we're sick and tired of this. We were looking forward to being released from some of the restrictions. And don't bother us with a lot of numbers about infection rates. Uh, let's just get this done. And I think that's the wrong attitude to have, but it, it, it is representative of probably about 40 or 45 percent of, of Albertans, primarily people who live outside the two big cities. And those are why, that's why those MLAs are representing their constituents.
does Lauren, does this put Kenny in a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't position where, you know, he imposes stricter measures, he gets people from his base worked up if he is too lenient or doesn't go hard against these people that, that you know, he's he's seen as not caring about the public health disaster. Yeah, it, that's, it's tough. You know, there was a, a, a poll that appeared in the National Post last week that showed province by province, uh, the public's acceptance of its provincial government's restrictions. And we were in Alberta by far the, uh, uh, the province that thought uh, the restrictions had gone too far. 45, 46% of, of Albertans thought the restrictions had gone too far. And, and that was quite well aware of the third wave that was, that was forming. Um, mm-hmm. At the same time, we had the smallest percentage of people who thought the government had it just right. We had about 10 or 12 percent. I happen to fall into that 10 or 12 percent. I think they've done a pretty good job of balancing personal freedoms with the need to restrict some personal movement and, and interpersonal interaction until we get uh, the, the numbers under control. Yeah. Now, you've been covering the, the legislature for quite a while, Lauren. You, you've been around through through the Klein years and and Stelmack and Redford. How does this kind of public criticism of the government from within its own party compare to past fissures in conservative politics? Like, is it more like the deep six, the people during the Klein era who felt that they should cut the budget more? Or are we getting closer to the Heather Forsyth and the Rob Anderson days where people look to other parties to represent their interests a little better? I don't think we're I don't think we're at the latter just yet. I mean, I, is there the potential that that if this goes on long enough and it's propelled to by a, a sluggish economy that there is going to be some uh, effort to form another party? Uh, sure, but I, I don't see a lot of evidence of that yet. I mean, I think it was a very smart move on Kenny's part to allow this pressure to be vented. Uh, to let the the uh, the malcontent UCP MLAs uh, have a voice and say, like, here is. I think it's very funny. We react so badly in these situations as as a profession because you know we talk about all the time about oh, there's too much party discipline in Canada. The, the caucuses are too whipped. Independent or MLA should have more independence. They should be able to have some autonomy and, and vote against the government every once in a while. That would be more representative of, of their constituents. And then every time there is an effort made to ease things up a bit, we all say, oh, there's a scandal. This is going to be a horrible fissure in the, in the UCP government and, and, and shows they're a great weakness. We have to find some way, I think, to to reconcile those two. I I don't think this is a huge weakness yet, but there are fault lines there that could crack open if uh, the government doesn't reopen soon enough or if the economy continues to go sideways. And there are lots of, of, of balls in the air, as it were. Yeah. Ashley, you're down at the legislature pretty much every day. You're interacting with politicians and staffers. You know, we had we had the letter come out. We had Jason Kenney offer a fairly strong public rebuke of these people saying that they don't speak for the government, that we'll make the decisions that are that are best for public health. Do you get a sense that, you know, that's that was said and now we're moving on to to other things or or is it this is the kind of thing that's kind of lingering in the in the air down there that there's kind of uh, upset or discontent over some of these issues? I agree with you saying that he issued a fairly strong rebuke of them. I think that with the exception of of maybe Cooper, who he gave a stern talking to a, a couple hours before uh, Cooper apologized, I think that Kenny's response has been pretty consistent in that, you know, MLEs are allowed to speak their minds, they're, spe- they're expressing the concerns of their constituents, but I have to follow the science. So I'm not sure if mm-hmm. that if that qualifies as a, as a stern rebuke or not. Um, but for me, I think what I will mostly be keeping an eye on is whether or not um, the public questioning of the health restrictions will impact uh, citizens' willingness to follow them if things get worse and we have to um, uh, restrict things more. 
I think th that will be um, an interesting thing in my mind to look at is whether or not people see um, MLAs in elected positions disagreeing with the rules and think it's therefore okay for them to also ignore them. Lauren, what do you make of that? You know, we're at, we're at a point where they're rolling out vaccines to more people. They just announced over the weekend. Uh, and as we're recording today on Tuesday, uh, people 40 and over can book to get the AstraZeneca vaccine. We're starting to see kind of a wider vaccine rollout. Uh, health outcomes from the virus may not be as serious, even if you're vaccinated and you, and you get the virus, that if case numbers start to go up and the premier and the chief medical officer of health look to stronger measures even for a short period to deal with a worsening third wave do you, do you feel that you know people may listen to these MLAs and say hey yeah you know we don't we don't like where we're at or or that just people are kind of like fed up with with restrictions after more than a year of dealing with this pandemic i think it i think it's the latter i i, I don't know whether they're going to listen to the MLAs or not i i i think lots of times uh people put far too much uh, people in in the decision making level and the elite level put far too much stock in what in what other people say. I remember a couple of weeks ago the premier tweeted out that he thought it was mostly uh, whacked out conspiracy theorists who are driving the public discontent. It's not. The public's discontent is based on there have been regulations for a long time. They're sick and tired of of this being an everyday occurrence. They're fatigued by having to think about this every time they go outside with their family. Mm -hmm. They are tired of the fact that, you know, one week, this is what the experts say, and another week, this is what the experts say. You, when you get, for instance, I, I've forgotten the name of the group. It's the Edmonton District Medical Association. Every time the government does something, they complain about it, and they all say, well, we're experts. Yes, but the government has its own experts, too. You're, you're disagreeing with Dina Hinshaw as much as you're disagreeing with Jason Kenney. And mm -hmm. the public had just had said there's a blizzard of information. We're throwing up our hands, and we're just going to keep our heads down for as long as we can. We'll, we'll restrict our movements somewhat, but we're not going to you know, hunker down in our houses in the fetal position and worry anymore about this. And and that's where that fatigue level is. And so I, do do I think they could impose more serious restrictions? I don't think very easily. I, I, I think what you're seeing now in Alberta, which is light by comparison to what a lot of other provinces are doing, but what you're seeing here is as far as we're prepared to go as, as a population, um, uh, unless there's something really drastic happening. Well, on that note, we'll leave it there. Ashley Joano, Lauren Gunter, thanks very much for joining us. You bet. Thank you. That's it for Under the Dome. Don't forget, you can find all past episodes at edmontonjournal.com slash under the dome, or you can hit that subscribe button on YouTube. I'm Dave Breckenridge. We'll see you next time.